Hello, everyone. Ladislas Maurice from TheWanderingInvestor.com. So today we'll be discussing with Chris McIntosh, a fund manager, and we'll be discussing a very interesting topic, uh, but a bit sad as well, which is investing in an age of conflict. So Chris, I've been reading your newsletter for quite a while now, for I think two, three years or so. And you've been warning about these things that are happening right now, uh, that we are entering a world where there will be more and more conflict, more and more geopolitical tension, and you've been positioning yourself essentially accordingly. So what are your thoughts on the current situation generally from a macro point of view? And then we can go into what your thoughts are, how one can translate this into investment, either opportunities or how to safeguard one's assets for the times ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back once again. I think I wanted to start with something that I see taking place, um, which is, I think, dangerous from an investment standpoint and certainly um, somewhat myopic. And that is that whenever you go into a period of conflict, people begin to take sides. Um, in most instances, what we're dealing with here is that mm -hmm. you have multiple multiple biases and multiple um, people, countries. It's best to treat them all as criminals um, and simply to understand that wars come about as a consequence of debt and debt comes about as a consequence of wars. There's an interplay between the two. And if we go back and we look through history, that is what continuously keeps playing out. Debt, um, over-indebted nations, especially those which have a um, certain level of power and influence, will go to war in order to um, retain or attempt to retain their influence and their power as they see their economic structure dwindling and waning. That's exactly where we're at today with respect to the Western world. And at the same time, wars themselves incur debt and cause debt accumulation. And so you can have other jurisdictions, excuse me, which get sucked into a war. And in order to defend themselves or to um, finance the wars, they go into debt. Today, we've got a dollar denominated system in such that the US dollar is the primary credit facility globally. And as a consequence, most nations have dollar-denominated debt. That puts the U.S. in particular in an extraordinarily powerful position. And they're, they're, they are in the process of really exerting that power through the credit markets, through the financial system, and so on and so forth. And I guess what the point I want to make is that if you get caught up in the he's right, he's wrong, and that sort of scenario, you can be blinded to the probabilities of outcome. And as an asset manager, that's my primary concern. My primary concern is to make money. If I can make money, I have much more probability for my own personal circumstances and those of my clients to actually have a better outcome, regardless of what might happen in the war or in, in any war, any conflict. So um, as, a, as a precursor, that's just something I want to I want to mention because it is so you know, as you mo move through these periods of conflict, there's you're going to be hearing multiple stories from multiple news outlets. And those news outlets in today's world are mostly 99% not independent. And even where they might be independent, they will often have their own bias as a consequence of maybe their religious beliefs or their um, ethnic beliefs or, or whatever. There's any number of different biases that any um, individual organization can have. And so it's it's really, really important to actually look at this from a macro perspective and look at why is there a conflict probable? Why is it possible? And what are the likely outcomes? And the answer to most of that comes into finances. War is an economic, um, uh, um, it's a consequence of economics always, every time. So if I follow your train of thought, this is going to continue. We have the largest 
levels of debt the world's ever seen at a sovereign level going into this. We've been writing about this for some years now. And simultaneously now, we have an accumulation and an acceleration of that sovereign level debt, um, which is why there is a rush towards the implementation of central bank digital currencies. In my belief, it is designed in part, um, there's many, many aspects to why, why that's wanted for um, central bankers and, and uh, I hate to call them the elite. We'll just we'll just say power brokers. There's many reasons, but one of the reasons is that there has to be a default. And if you do, if you go back in through history, whenever you have a default, often those that are in power lose their seat of power. Not always, but often. That's a huge risk today in the Western financial system, and they're not stupid. They understand that, so they're orchestrating. Um, as best as they can to have something in place such that they don't lose that power. Power is everything. Central bank digital currencies will afford a level of power and control that nothing that we've ever experienced in our lives, certainly within the financial mechanisms, has existed. In other words, they can default without anyone escaping and without having the capital flight um, taking place at a rapid pace, which is what normally happens. Now, so that's a sort of framework, and we can see that rolling out. Those that are aware of this are already moving and have already been moving capital. We're, we're, we're watching that transpire. Um, and so um, it's, it's, that, that's kind of the financial mechanism behind it. Um, if we want to roll into where one might want to be I'm thinking about holding assets or, or things of that nature. It's quite simple. Wars are never deflationary. Um, they are, I would say, stagflationary. Um, you could say inflationary, but that's not entirely accurate, and it's not accurate because you can, you've can. you got a dynamic in there where you'll have certain asset classes can be intensely deflationary. In a war, people don't spend a whole lot of money on... Um, on certain consumer goods, for example, um, where where you basically have a recessionary environment, but at the same time, the cost of critical goods is rising largely as a consequence of supply constraints. And that's very much the situation that we're in today. The asset classes that typically benefit, that inflate rather than deflate, are hard assets, commodities, in particular energy, um, so that's kind of a framework going into this conflict environment that we are all already in. The huge kicker to all of this is that prior to this, if we go all the way back to sort of the previous crash in the commodities and in particular in the energy market in the sort of 2012 through um, sort of 17, 18 period, we've had a decimation of supply. We've also had a lack, a massive lack of capital investment going into these sectors. And ordinarily, that capital investment would have picked up by now. And it hasn't. It hasn't. And it hasn't for a number of reasons, one of which is the woke agenda, um, the, you know, fighting um, the weather by, um, by drinking your uh, drinks through paper, straws and things of that nature, which definitely fixes the weather. In any event, so a lot of this has brought about huge huge constraints in capital expenditure. The other thing that's, that's at least for us, where, where we're focused, and I'm getting a little bit more detailed in sort of sectors within sectors, if you take long cycle assets, um, and I mean long cycle assets as in ones that are very, very capital intensive and that have a payback time frame over, say, 20, 30 years, in order to invest into those kind of assets, you're always needing debt um, because they're very expensive. So if you take, say, an offshore drill rig, there are about 1.2 billion-ish, probably a bit more now. Um, if you could get one built, bloody hard to get them built because the shipyards are all um, over capacity. You'd need about four offshore rigs to service it. Those are going to cost you about 70 million bucks a pop. Um, it's it's the entire thing is very capital intensive and you have to use debt 
Now, who's going to finance that? At the moment, it's very, very difficult to go and obtain finance for something in that space, number one, because what you need there, Ladislas, is a certainty of outcome. To deploy capital over that time frame, you need to know that the political environment is probably not going to change too much. You need to know that your economic, i.e. your financing environment, isn't going to be changing too much. And by the way, that's changing a lot, right? Rates have moved. If you go back to, say, five, six years ago and look at what rates were then and look at what rates are now, you have to sit down. You've got to start calculating out and going, okay, well, it's, if it's a 30-year or a 20-year time frame, what does this look like on financing level? That level of uncertainty means you have to add in a premium to what your cost of capital is likely to be. Not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And so what happens then as a consequence of that uncertainty is capital providers just keep pulling back. They're like, I can't be sure. I need more premium. I need more premium. I can't be sure. I can't. Um, anyway, so that's that particular space is extraordinarily interesting to us. It's also interesting because everyone that was in that peak previously has been washed away. <laughs> like probably... I haven't done we we did the numbers a little while back. It's about it was about ninety two percent of the companies that existed in that space have gone away, like gone away. And so what you now have is a moat around the existing businesses. And guess what? Most of them are running at about ninety percent capacity, which is full capacity because you you're often having to stay have stuff in maintenance care and maintenance and stuff. So um, I'm just kind of digging into one of the sectors, but <clears throat> certainly in the energy space, energy always does well, gets fought over um, always, which is why there is conflict in the Makinda heartland um, right now. Um, it's why Ukraine exists. It's why Israel and Iran are um, you know, going behind the bike sheets and you know, slapping each other in the face. A lot of this is why the U.S. in particular has always had a presence within the Middle East. Um, it's why the Bosphorus is so important. It's why the Suez is so important. And it's why the Strait of Hormuz is so important. All of these things are geopolitical choke points around the Mekinda heartland. And whoever controls that to a large extent controls trade flows globally. That's what's being fought over. It's been fought over for centuries and we're just back to repeating that again so to some extent this is very easy to understand from a macro long-term historical perspective and as such it's relatively easy to go and see what are the asset classes that benefit and what are the asset classes that don't um so it's 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 kind of um kind of an easy time to some degree to invest but at the same time it's there's extraordinary risk because you could still get a sector right and you could be in a particular company for example that lands up being uh, nationalized and things and that that sort of stuff is absolutely going to happen so it also means you need to be very aware of what's going on at a country um, political level as well as being diversified across um across geographies but within sectors if that makes sense sure so let me take your your two theses here and just stress test them um so let's say cool we go and invest in energy so obviously we have to go through equities great we do that and then let's take your C cbdc thesis and potential for capital controls and issues in western countries we stress test this so isn't there a, a possible scenario whereby I chose the right stocks, they're doing great, but suddenly they get stuck behind some capital controls um, in some Western countries that suddenly have a, you know, a current account issue or whatever, boom, CBDC capital controls, and then great, you know, my money is stuck in whatever jurisdiction. So, you know, one, isn't this a risk? Two, do you then... Do you have to be again? If we're taking, we're going down the rabbit hole a little bit, but it's an inter interesting mm -hmm. intellectual exercise. Yep. Um, do we then have to choose specific exchanges where we believe capital controls are likely to come later or last, like you know the U.S. or like Norway, 
and to be rather avoiding exchanges like the ones in Italy and France? Um, as many answers to that. Uh, basically, yes, it's a it, it is a significant risk. It's one worth certainly considering. Um, my answer to it largely is number one: pay huge attention. You know, you've got to you got to keep your eye on the ball at all times. And when you see something rolling out, you need to be aware of what that's likely to look like. Um, the the flip side of that is that all wars are are competitive it, or, or conflicts are competitive and they're competitive not just in terms of like throwing bombs at each other or whatever it is they're competitive at an, at an economic level the most prosperous economic um, structure typically wins uh, over time that's just because it, it allows you to commandeer more resources it, it's why the u.s western um westphalian system basically defeated the Bolshevik system. That was an economic that war of attrition, which was won. Um, and so that's likely to transpire again. I don't know for sure what economic system comes out of the, this over the next 10, 15 years, but I'm relatively confident that whatever does come out is likely to be the most um, economically beneficial system relative to others that are being implemented so if we go when i talk about others being implemented certainly from what i can tell the european U union in particular is probably first on the pointy end of the stick with respect to the implementation of capital controls um, central bank currencies etc which are um, basically allow for um, capital controls to be implemented and I, and, and again that's 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 not only just because I'm watching it rolling out, but it's also because if you look at the economic and the debt structure, they have to do it faster than everybody else because there's more screw than anyone else. <laughs> um, so again, it's economics yeah. that drives the necessity for the 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 rollout of whatever they're doing. Now, that particular rollout will absolutely totally cause capital flight, a hundred percent. It'll be more difficult, and your average man on the street probably will get crushed and won't get get out. But you know, I grew up in Africa. I watched capital controls take place in multiple countries, and I still watched capital flee. There are human beings are incredibly resilient and flexible, and they will find ways to get the capital out, yeah. whether it be um, chartering barges in Mozambique, as I watched people do, and putting barrels of oil on it and sailing it to Athens and converting it, like. It's going to happen, and what it does is it it, it causes the the jurisdiction that's implementing those controls literally just sucks, collapses, and just it, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And then in an economic war, they can't fight up the war. They can't they can't fight a physical war because they haven't got the the, the energy. They haven't got the the fuel to fight it with. Um, and and what and there's a dynamic there whereby any enemy, if you will. Um, that is fighting with that, we'll see um, be the benefits of capital coming in, right? Or, or there will be jurisdictions which see the benefits of capital coming in. And what we do as human beings, when, when something works for us, we tend to do more of it. Um, and, and so there is, a, there is a, a decent probability that we're going to see that, where not only will we see a constriction in certain areas, we're also going to see breakaways as this whole thing fractures. And there will be regions which just turn around and go, hey, we're doing X. And that X will be something that's much more economically beneficial for them and for individuals with respect to freedoms of transactability and everything else. I see, I see your point. Um, and also to the, so the, there's a whole segment of the US population that keeps talking about the dollar crash, the dollar crash, the dollar crash. Look, guys, before the dollar crashes, the euro will crash. And when the euro crashes, oh, most of that money will rush into the dollar. So the dollar can't crash. If if you understand the, the actual yeah. mechanisms of international finance, the dollar's not going to crash. I understand that it sells newsletters. I understand it gets people all jittery and everything else. Now, that's not to say that the dollar will not decline in value against certain assets. You can have a dollar 
imploding against gold, for example. Yeah. But that's not within the fiat currency system. The idea that the dollar's going away is 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 not only naive. It's 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 um it's it's factually wrong. And I say that because it's it's if you run through the mathematics and the, and the structure of how it works, you understand that it, it cannot take place. Yeah, I, I agree. And to go back to the discussion on capital controls, I think it's important to see that historically governments have been very good at creating segments in terms of resident and non-residents. So typically capital controls impact residents, but non-residents are generally not immediately impacted because governments know that if they put capital controls on non-residents, then finished. They will have zero inflows back into the country. But if they just essentially rape their own people, um, foreigners can still come in. They can still get FDI because FDI knows that it can get out easily in and out. Um, so well, I'd say that generally speaking, you're less at risk, for example, if you're investing in Italian equities from overseas, that your money will get stuck in Italy than if you were in Italy, residing in Italy, having an Italian brokerage account. I don't know what your thoughts are on this. If you think about what is it that capital controls are, are designed to do, they're designed to keep domestic capital um, in, and they're designed to keep people in. So um, your your tax slaves, your citizens, um, are are in most instances, in like most countries, even in wealthy countries, your average citizen doesn't have second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, ninth, tenth passports. They also don't have assets or resources offshore. In other words, they have all of their eggs in one particular basket, and the government knows that. So the government can treat them like cattle, and they do. On the contrary, when you've got some FDI, um, which is you know somebody that has invested capital in the country, but they're not a resident, they're not, a, or they might be a resident, but they're not a citizen, um, and it's it is typically a portion of their capital. Okay, as such, they can pull it out, and they, they don't care to the same degree. That the level of exposure that they have is significantly different. Trying to capture those people is a futile event. Right, and so, and not only do you not capture them, you shut, as you mentioned, you shut down any inflows of capital. So it doesn't, it doesn't really work. The times that they do implement that is more when they're trying to rally domestic support around a political process. In other words, it's the bad X, Y, Z name your particular ethnic group or or or, or income group or whatever it is. And they're the ones to blame, and we're going to have to do X, Y, Z and vote for me, and I'll sort things out. It's going to, life's going to be a paradise. <clears throat> um, that can and does sometimes happen. We've seen it in, in certain African countries. Um, but but in general, you're correct in that um, where you're – and look, we've got the ability to do this typically as, as sort of – if you have a relative level of wealth, it, you know, setting up another bank account – is in a foreign jurisdiction and, and placing some capital, even if it's cash, or you know some other real estate. You do a lot of real estate around the world. Things of that nature are much much easier to do than most people think. Yeah, um, it's more a mental hurdle that they have to get over, as opposed to the physical um, way to actually go about doing it. Um, that will, anyone with two fat fingers and a fucking keyboard can can figure out how to do a lot of this stuff with a with you know even just a week's research on on a particular jurisdiction and the methodology and the processes and the banking environment and the all the legal frameworks and that stuff is is if you, if you if you can learn how to read you can do that it's not hard now it's just a mental process of getting around why would I do that and what would it what benefits would it afford to me and my I would suggest in the environment that we're in now, it's not just smart to do, it's almost critical. Yeah. I mean, that's what I, I preach constantly on my on my channel, on my blog. It's internationalization and diversification uh, because we don't know where the shots are going to be coming from. 
but at least if you're well diversified, well internationalized, if I can put it this way, um, you always be fine. So I, I look at my own portfolio. I have a lot of international real estate. I have a lot of equities on different brokerage accounts, bank accounts, a bit everywhere. At any given point, something's blowing up in my portfolio at any given point. But at the same time, I'm, I sleep very well at night because I'm, I'm diversified. It's, you know, there's no single blow that'll put me down. You got no single point of failure. Yeah. No single point of failure. There are times when you go through history where you can pretty much put everything on black. Um, and those times typically are post-war where everything's settled and with a clear winner and the governments are now basically bankrupt um, and or debts have been wiped out dependent upon who, who won and who lost. That environment is typically an environment where you can be ridiculously concentrated at a geographical level going in and, and you can probably sit for the next 20 years and just not do a whole lot. The environment that we're in now is basically that whole shattering. Everything gets shattered. And in that environment, you, A, you have to be much more attentive to what's going on, and B, you need to be much more diversified. Yeah, 100%. So where's capital going to go? To where it's treated best, as always. So um, there's a couple of things where capital will go to and is going to. Um, really within, if you look at sectors, it's going into commodity markets, it's going into um, energy, it's going into basically, I would say, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Part of that is also if you look at where where we are being attacked. Um, so flip, flip the question, what is it that we are constantly being told is bad for us that we shouldn't have, that's, that's destroying the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Those very factors are the ones that are being um, constrained in supply. So it's food. We're told to eat bugs. Meat is apparently, and cows, cows farting absolutely destroys the planet, obviously. Um, so it's food, it's, um, uh, it's energy, coal, um, anything within that space, even nuclear. And now is so they're flip-flopping on nuclear. In lot, and this is where you're seeing a lot of the shit breaking up where the narrative that's been put forward um, meets reality because the narrative's garbage and the reality is is evident and as it becomes evident it's more in, it's increasingly difficult for your lower rung politicians to be able to sustain uh, popularity and everything else and so they have to sometimes flip flop so we've seen for example them changing the definitions around natural gas saying oh well, it's not really a fossil fuel it's kind of like um it's sort of green, you know, there's probably a bit of a green tinge when it comes out of the soil. And so that's green and, um, and nuclear is not, you know, so there's, there's a flip flopping there, but the entire space <clears throat> has already been largely um, castrated. And so those sectors, which are being, um, which we're being, we're being pressured are the ones which this, the, the, the demand doesn't even, the demand can even fall. But if your supply is falling faster, your price goes up. That attracts capital. It attracts capital because human beings have like the psychology of a human being is that they will take advantage always of an opportunity. That's what we do. And so though we're seeing capital moving into those sectors. But what's interesting is that we're seeing it moving in on a geographical basis. It's very different. Largely in the Western world, your Western banks, your Western um uh, majors even are not participating to the degree that your non-western participants are chinese banks are financing you'd know this they're financing everything in africa yeah. why are they in africa because they're after all of the commodities why are they building ports there it's not because they want pretty ports it's because they want to ship all this stuff out and they want to they want to secure it so we're seeing incredible shifts of capital in that space. They're using all their treasuries to literally secure supply chains and to secure commodities and to secure the hard assets that, that they want. And so that's significant. And there's not enough spoken about that in, in certainly in the Western press. Um, the only time you see it is sort of when they go, there'll be some hit piece basically on um, you know, the Chinese are, are bad or and they've 
I don't know. Um, Chinese debt trap, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look, there's a part of that's absolutely true. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that Chinese are good guys. I'm, I'm just saying this is a reality of economics. Um, and frankly, the, the West has done it for for decades. The, the, the entire, that's why the IMF was set up. It's an entire debt trap situation. Um, and it's, it's, it's encumbered much of the developing world for ages and ages. Um, and even that you're seeing break up. That's why those West African states all broke away because they were under the hegemony of the French central bank, essentially. Um, and what did we have? Eight of them go in three years. That That's part of that breakup system. Now, I'm not naive enough to to not consider at least the, the, the possibility that there weren't Chinese and Russian interests and influence behind those coups. I'm quite certain there were. That doesn't matter. And it's not a good guy, bad guy. Like I said, all these people are basically psychopaths. But that's the reality of that. You're talking about where's capital shifting to. That's what we're seeing on a macro basis taking place. Well, cool. look, very interesting, Chris. Look, guys, if you're interested in that sort of thinking and how it translates into in investment ideas, um, I, I really recommend Chris's newsletter. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything that he writes in there, but it's very different from anything that you'll read out there. And it's great to balance your essentially normal reading that you do uh, so that you can see always different sides to to the same story, which can really help you make um, make your own decisions and help you do your own due diligence on uh, on ideas that you're researching. So there is a, a link below. And I think, Chris, um, you're giving a discount as well to people that um, use my link below. So, yeah, great. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. It's great to be back. Good to see you again, Ladislas. Make sure to download my free ebook, 12 Mistakes to Avoid When Investing in International Real Estate, which you can find on my website, link below. And feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.